What's up guys, John John the Wise here and I got another cyberpunk video for you guys and this time we are going to be talking about net running. If you ever thought about making a net runner and you were like, man, it's just a world, uh, cyberpunk is already a new world and now I got to dive into this world within the world and it's so confusing and there's so many pages. Well, hey, don't worry about it. I'm here to give you the lowdown from beginning to end exactly how it is to be a net runner, what to expect, what to bring with you, what to study, and all the things in between, advanced, basic, you name it. Just like my combat video, there will be timestamps in the description and on the bar below, so you guys can navigate through this, come back if you think that you need to watch some other part of the video again, and it should be easier for you to understand things as you can skip stuff that you already know and get to the juicy details that you need to. But before we get into that, make sure you guys join that Discord community. The link will be in the description below. I have a community that I am a part of and I love these guys. This is Cyberpunk 2020 and Red fans that just want to help you with your games. And make sure you guys are subbed to my podcast, Tabletop Cyberpunk, where I talk about cyberpunk at length about different issues. I have guests on. It's a really fun, great time. And I throw my actual plays on there too so you guys can listen to them on your commute. And don't forget to join the Patreon if you want to show your support, patreon.com slash johnjohnthewise. There is an exclusive series. If you watched my last video, which was building an epic campaign, that was episode one of the series. And if you want to get episode two, three, four, five, and everything down the line, you're going to have to be subscribed to that Patreon. I will eventually release it to the public, but if you want to get it soon, ASAP then get on that Patreon, all right? And make sure you guys follow me on social media, John John the Wise. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and all those good things. Let's connect. All right, how about we get into the video? Let's do it. So let's get into it. Those of you that are brand new to the game and don't understand net running, let me give you guys a quick rundown of what net running is in Cyberpunk Red. The net used to be something called the old net. And this was just like the internet that we know today in the world of Cyberpunk 2020. A net runner would be able to sit at their house in a panic room or something and get onto the net, connect to Arasaka databases or anywhere else that was connected to the internet, which is pretty much the entire world, right? Well, some stuff happened. You can find the lore in the book. And now the old net has been shut down. Now, if you want to connect to any kind of database, you have to be within range of its access point, which in game terms is six meters or three squares. Yes, three squares within an access point. And you can locally connect to whatever net they have in that building, in that organization. And that's how you do your hacking minigame in Cyberpunk Red. Why did they do this? Because this now forces the Netrunner to be part of the party, has to be there. The Netrunner is now also a combatant. You might want to make one that's like a martial artist or some crazy stuff like that. So the Netrunner has to be there if they want to get into the net. So throughout this video, I will be saying the net, and what I really mean is net architecture, which is a enclosed architecture of what the net would have been like out in the old days, but now this is like a small version of it inside this one Arasaka building or nomad encampment or whatever. And I'll be saying net, but what I really mean is net architecture. So there's two realities to the net. There is net space, where when you are within the net and net running, that world that you see is called the net space. And then there's the meat space, which is what world we are in, the, the world, the IRL world, as they would say. And the way it works is you have something called virtuality goggles that you put on. It's an overlay and you can see the net in the room that you're in. It like overlays, like kind of like augmented reality. It'll appear in front of the room that you're in. So that way you can still see other guys shooting at you. You can see hazards, you can see obstacles within the room. And at the same time, you are fighting hellhounds and liches and demons inside the net 
uh, while you're doing all that. This way, you can be really a part of the party. You're not a burden and you can react for yourself and you can even choose to forego your net actions of doing stuff in the net to fire your gun or your shotgun or throw a grenade or whatever you need to do to survive in that combat encounter. Only net runners can access the net and net architectures because they have something called interface which is a special ability that only they can access while other people can do like an electronic security check with like a tech tool or something like that or even their agent to get into a system it takes them five minutes where a net runner it takes them three seconds so combat rounds take three seconds that means in the three seconds that a round goes on a net runner can do so many things that your five minutes just are, are not going to cut it the best metaphor that I can give you on what the net is like when you're in it, how you visualize it, how you navigate it, is it's like an elevator. Once you enter into it, you're at the first floor, then you'll see like a password, a control node, a black ice, or some kind of hazard and challenge that will make you have to deal with it and make decisions to progress to the next floor. The higher up you go in this floor, the more you'll encounter more and more dangerous things or harder to crack things, but also the prizes are juicier. You'll find the files that are deeply hidden there that will damn Arasaka or Militech, and that's the stuff that they don't want you to get. So as you can see, you go through each floor, one, two, three, four, five, sometimes it splits, and that is how you navigate through this net. Each floor will have one challenge, and then you move on to the next floor, that floor will have its own challenge too. A basic summary of all the things that you'll find within the net are hazards that will stop you in your path, then that can actually kill you like black ice programs or demons, or you'll find stuff like passwords that are really easy to get through that don't really hurt you or anything, they just stall you. And then there's the juicier stuff like files of databases and control nodes that control turrets, doors, cameras, laser grids, I mean you name it. There's all kinds of stuff and creativity within the book to give you an idea of what stuff you can do as a netrunner. Sometimes you'll go into a net architecture and the moment you jack in, you do like a preliminary search to see what's going on with this architecture, how dangerous it is. And if you don't roll well enough, then you might not know how dangerous it is on the next floor. Like you'll get information on floor one, two, and three, but four, five, and six are a complete mystery. You might not even know there's a four, five, and six. You'll get to three and the GM will tell you, hey, there's actually another floor. And you might think to yourself like all right let me push my luck maybe there's something here and if we reach the bottom of this floor then we can do some really nasty things like leave a virus so why don't we push our luck and even though we don't know what's on out there in the unknown i'm i have a uh, trust in my skills that i'll be able to get through it and that is the risk reward that net runners go through part your party will be helping you to make these decisions so that's really one of the funnest parts of being a net runner is risking it for the biscuit i'm probably going to say that a lot in this video all right let's move on to some basic information about net running let's get into the nitty gritty and then we'll move on to the advanced section well before you risk it the first thing you want to think about is your cyber deck every net architecture is different and you really can't account for all the things that are you're going to be experiencing within the net but you can try to come as prepared as possible. And that's what your cyber deck is. It is your sword, it is your weapon within the net, it is everything that you need to interface within the net. So you gotta remember, your cyber deck, it relies on its slots available. A poor quality one will have less slots than an excellent quality one made with uh, more better designs and higher quality and uh, higher luxury, etc. It's up to your game master and your own homebrew ideas. But the idea is that these slots all have important locations where you can put programs, hardware, upgrades and when you enter the net you're like i have all these tools at my disposal i have come with a prepared build kind of like a deck building game or something like that and you're ready to tackle what the net has to offer you you have to make sure that you come prepared before you go into a mission or anything that you do because it takes at least one hour to uninstall and reinstall programs and stuff like that. So if it's a heated moment of battle and, and you're in the thick of it, you're not going to have time to switch out things on your cyber deck. 
There are three basic types of programs that you can take with you and that take slots within your cyber deck and let me go through them for you guys right now. Boosters are something that you can take with you. These are programs that can help you in your interface checks. They'll help you with your roles. They'll add positive modifiers to any checks that you need to make. The second type of programs are called defender programs and these are programs that will help you mitigate danger, mitigate the hazards that are within the net and these are really important to look over because they can help you be better equipped while you go into the unknown. The third, and in my opinion, the most important type of programs are called attacker programs. You want to look at these very closely because these are the programs that you'll be using to battle net runners, black ice, demons, and anything else within the net. These are your weapons that you take within the net, and these are your weapon programs. My first set of commands that I'm going to give you guys are scan, jack in, Pathfinder. So this is how it works. Scan is a meet space action. That means it's an action within the IRL real world. When you do that, it gives you the ability to try to find an access point within your location. The better you roll, the better you'll be at finding that location and the GM will decide if you were close enough or rolled well enough to find it. Next, once you scan, you jack in. That means you will get within six meters of this access point. You jack into it, either remotely or, or with some kind of interface cables. And then the first thing you're going to want to do is a, scan, is a pathfinder. The pathfinder will give you a map of this entire net architecture. And the better you roll, the more floors will be revealed, the more hazards will be revealed. And if your GM feels like it, they'll even tell you the DVs for each one of these uh, rooms that you'll be going through. This is really important. You're going to be using this a lot. Scan especially is something that you'll probably be doing outside of combat just so you can know where the access point is for future reference. So remember, scan, jack in, pathfinder. Passwords are going to be something that you come across all the time. They're probably going to be the first thing that you come across. And what you'll need to do is run a backdoor check and the backdoor will get you past the password. It's really simple. That's basically it. Now let's talk about black ice. These are really important because these are going to be the things that can possibly kill your character. These programs vary in the effects that they have and shapes and sizes and severity of power, but really the common denominator with all of them is they are designed to stop netrunners in their tracks and make them either turn around, surrender, get out, or die before they get past them. The first time you encounter a black ice, it gets a free round of an attack against you. You'll be rolling against its attack and with an opposing roll, if it passes, its effect hits you automatically, no matter what part of the initiative order or anything you're in, even if you're outside of combat. The first time you see a black ice program, it gets a shot at you. If you're able to beat it in the opposing roll, then the effect takes its no effect and you just move on as normally. You can attempt to, on your turn, destroy the black ice or as it is called, de-res it. Once you kill its HP or res as it's called within the net, then it ceases to exist in that current state of the net architecture and you can now move past it onto the next floor. Another way you can deal with black ice is if you think that you can't really take it or it's not really worth your time, you can use the slide ability. The slide ability, or command I should say, the slide command lets you get past a black ice program if you beat it with an opposing roll. It's perception against your speed and you'll be able to get past it if you pass. If you don't, then it automatically will be able to attack you on the next turn. You stay exactly where you are and basically you you did it all for naught. Sometimes this is a really good idea just to get past it, especially for brevity. You don't really want to have this long extended combat with a black ice program, but you got to remember one big detail if you want to slide away from a black ice program. If for any reason you get disconnected from this net architecture without using the jack out command, and basically that means either someone severed your connection, ran a, date, de a deck crash against you, which is a nasty, nasty program we'll get into later, or you walked away from the six meter range of this access point. Every single Black Eyes program that you have slid from, if all those three things, any of those three things happen, 
every Black Ice program gets one free shot at you without having to roll. It automatically, the effects hit you. So that is a scary thing to happen to a Netrunner if they've got three, four, five Black Ice programs that they just dodged back there. So keep that in mind anytime you want to slide. If you don't know, if your Pathfinder check wasn't good enough to tell you how many floors were ahead of you, you might have to deal with the Black Ice program just to be safe and not to get hit with those effects because you have no idea what's on around the corner. Control nodes are also another common room that you'll come across. Let's say you got past the password and a black eyes program, you might see a control node there and a control node will be able to control turrets, doors, anything electronic, any kind of environmental defense, any kind of emplacement. Control is basically the thing that you will need to do to take over a system and move it manually. Files are another common part of the net. These are things that are hidden within it, usually deep within the upper floors because they're really important and have damning evidence that will screw over corporations and government entities that are corrupt. So finding that kind of information is really the juicy part of net running. And that's where you want to venture out into the unknown and find those files because they move the plot or they reveal a secret or they give you a leg up on your enemies that you normally wouldn't have or it makes you filthy rich because you found some information that's worth selling. The final basic aspect of net running is I got to remind you guys about the architecture reset. So if you, for some reason, do not want to be in this net architecture anymore, let's say you're going through it and you're like, all right, I'm done here. Let me jack out. Let me leave or you get forced to leave. When you come back, this net architecture will have reset. All its black ice are back. All its files are back. All its everything, everything exactly the way it was before you came in will go back to exactly how it was. And that means that all your hard work is gone. That's where a deck crash can be super terrible. Like I said, we'll get later into the video, but you do not want to get hit with the deck crash. You do not want to jack out and reset the system. Alternatively, you want to get to the bottom of this system if you want to alter it and leave a virus, which we'll get into in the advanced section coming up. Remember that if you do not get the prize that you need from this net architecture, you really have to decide whether you're going to leave before you get the prize because going back is going to be double the work, triple the work, depending on exactly what happened in your scenario. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty of the advanced part of net running. This is stuff that it doesn't really come to you automatically. We all know exactly how net running really works. We understand what hacking is. We understand getting into databases, but there's cool stuff and nuances to net running that Artel Saurian Games has added that you might miss because it's, it's hard to take in that kind of new information. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit more nuance, give you some ideas of a build and stuff that you can do for game masters and for net runners that will really blow your mind on how awesome net running can be. Let's go back to your cyber deck. Cyber, cyber deck slot management is very important. As I said, before you go into a net run, you have to have all your ducks in a row and all your weapons ready to go. So your cyber deck has to be ready. Some of those slots can be taken over by hardware upgrades. And these are upgrades that are not programs, they're not stuff that you can use within the net, but they help you from getting lit on fire or it's an extra hard drive, or there's some other cool stuff like DNA locks to make sure other people can't use your cyber deck. These are all like fluff and lore information and, and these are really cool things that can help you within your net run and you should take a really close look at these upgrades before you fill your entire cyber deck with a bunch of programs and stuff like that. The second part of cyberdeck slot management is an idea that I didn't understand right away because it's one of those nuanced ideas that just got past my head, is more copies of the same program in your cyberdeck. So while you're in the net, you can only activate one program at a time. And that means if I have a sword program that attacks a black ice, I can use it once to attack that black ice. But if I want to use it again in my turn, I'd have to deactivate it and reactivate it again. 
And that is going to take up three actions when I could have had two copies of the sword program. I could have activated one and the other and then done some other thing on the third one like a zap. And that would have been way more damage. This is really important. You probably want to take one, two, or three different types of attacker programs with you. And I know that you have limited deck slot space, but that's why slot management is very important. All right, let's talk about demons. Demons are something like Black Eyes programs, as in they are programs that are within a net architecture. Demons are more like net runners than they are like Black Eyes programs, as in they have a number of net actions and they have a priority of things that they need to do. But basically, they will use turrets and any other type of control device that they can use within combat first and then if they have any actions left over they will attack the net runner that is within their net these demons follow you throughout every floor you cannot slide against them you cannot evade them they follow you at every step of the way they know when you're immediately in the net architecture they can detect you immediately if they hadn't already seen you within the cameras and most of all the cool thing about them is they can be destroyed or de-resed. They have hit points or res points. And as you go along the net architecture, you can decide, you know what, let me take this demon out because it's killing all my buddies in this combat with their turrets, uh, with its turrets. And I want to take over those turrets. While I can't find the turrets in this net architecture yet, I better get rid of that thing because it's just an, it's a nuisance. And they will fight alongside of you against against you with other Black Eyes programs if you're encountering Black Eyes programs as well. So these demons are really, really nasty. You put them in a net architecture and some net runners might just think like, you know what, it's not worth it. This is a, a little bit too much. But our players, we know that they see something like that and they think it's an awesome challenge. Next, let's talk about enemy net runners. Most databases and net architectures i should say that you go through will have passwords and then a black ice and then a control and a file and then you get to the bottom and you do your thing and you get out and that's usually the the most common types of net runs but when you add stuff like demons and other net runners you're adding a wild card to this scenario that net run it becomes like a totally different kind of thing Enemy netrunners are something that can be really nasty to your player netrunners and they have to abide by all the same rules that you abide by when you are within the net. So that means they have a cyber deck, they have their programs, but they have anti-personnel programs like deck crash that we talked about earlier. Deck crash is something that we'll still get into later on in the video, but it's something that can make you get ejected or jacked out unsafely from the net architecture. So you want to make sure you have that with you. Or alternatively, also, that means that they have to be within six meters of an access point, just like your net runner is. And this means your buddies, if they get line of sight on this net runner, can take them out old fashioned style and eliminate them as a threat within the net. If you know you're going to be going up against another enemy net runner, then you want to bring anti-personnel programs and you want to also bring black ice programs. And yeah, you can literally throw a black ice program out at a net runner like you're playing some weird crazy version of Pokemon. And that's something to keep in mind to have on your cyber deck as well as all the other programs that you have to deal with net runners that you think you'll be coming across in the future. All right, now let's get into defenses. There are three different types of defenses. There are active defenses, which are robots that are connected to the architecture and serve as additional hazards that are in meat space. And these defenses must be controlled by a net runner or a demon. Second, there are in place defenses. These are restricted to a small area and have a trigger or a specific action that sets them off. They do not need to be controlled by a demon or net runner, but are limited to function based off of that trigger that they have. 
Environmental defenses are systems that are part of the room or series of rooms that the net architecture is connected to. If a demon is not present to control this hazard, then it's someone's job to turn it on before they clock out on their shift. And these defenses can be there as another alternative way to mess with the players. I mean, it would be terrible if you didn't have a net runner and these defenses existed because some of them are really nasty and really hard to uh, get over as far as like obstacles and stuff like that. Now remember, Netrunners, there is no rule stating that there can't be multiple Black Ice programs on a single floor, multiple demons, multiple turrets. I mean, there are the, the ability to have all those things. There's no rules against it. So if your Cyber Psycho Game Master decides that they want to throw three Black Ice and Raish Bartmoss themselves at you, you got to be prepared. You got to know that that is a possibility. All right, let's talk about viruses. When you reach the bottom floor of a net architecture, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever it is, the last floor has to be, your GM will tell you you are at the final floor. You can leave what is called a virus. It takes two net actions to compose a virus, and basically what you do is you tell your game master how you are permanently altering this net architecture. I'm deleting all the hard drives, I'm making all the turrets overload and start firing in multiple directions, and I'm going to make sure that the next net runner that comes into this uh, net architecture is fried in instantly when they come in. If you say you want to do something like that, then your game master has to decide, okay, how difficult uh, uh, would it be to write that program? And they assign a difficulty number that you will have to beat with 1d10 plus your interface, which if your starting character is a 4. And if you beat the number that your GM has decided, then you leave that program. And if you do not beat that number, then you did not successfully write the program that you needed to the that you needed to. And the whatever number you get, the next net runner that comes into the system can attempt to destroy your virus by beating that number. So you see, if you beat your GM then you leave the virus, everything's all good. If you fail your GM, then hopefully you rolled high enough that the next net runner that comes in cannot beat your virus and it succumbs to the virus until they find somebody that can delete this virus. Now let's talk about Cloak. Cloak is a command that is available to net runners and this is something that net runners usually forget. What Cloak does is it makes sure it, de it deletes all trace of your existence within this net architecture. And the way it works is you roll 1d10 plus your interface. And that number, that result, is what the next net runner that comes in after you will have to beat to be able to trace your steps and see what you did within this net architecture. Maybe you left some kind of raw data or IP that they can backtrace and now there's a bunch of solos knocking on your door at night. So you wanna make sure you leave a really good cloak check before you leave the place, especially if you haven't left a virus, you haven't reached the bottom floor, and you're like, well, I just wanna get out of here without leaving a virus, but I still need to make sure I leave a cloak. Cloak costs only one action, uh, unlike a virus that costs two actions, and it is really important to do because if you don't do it, then your GM can rub their hands and go, ooh, he forgot to cloak before he left and make sure that there's a hit squad after you the next time you guys are out and about hanging out. The final nuanced idea that I have that is definitely not within the book is destroying the access point. Whatever the access point is, I usually like to imagine it as some kind of modem or router or electronic device that the Netrunner can connect to. Maybe it's not that, maybe it's like a small little dongle that is like connected to something on the wall. But either way, the idea is if you destroy this access point, that means you or any other Netrunner that's in that room cannot access this net architecture anymore. It doesn't delete the net architecture, it still exists in some kind of server or cloud or whatever, but that access point that got you into that net architecture is no longer available and you'll have to find another one somewhere else. 
When you destroy these access points, you ensure that other net runners within the room cannot access them as well. And though it is kind of like a scorched earth policy, it sometimes is a better thing to do, especially if you are outnumbered and there are more net runners in the enemy team than there are in your team. Like, you don't have a net runner. You're all four solos. Just destroy the access point, get it over with, and we'll get out of here before the day's end, right? All right, guys, I know that was a lot of information. Hopefully you took advantage of the timestamps below. I hope you guys enjoyed all the information that I gave you about net running. It is one of the best parts about cyberpunk red i love having a net runner within my party it makes me excited to create these net runs and give them the ability to support their other players and teammates so look into it if you've ever wanted to play a net runner i hope this video helped you out and we'll see you on the next one guys thank you so much take care bye <laughs>